Oh, turn to the book of Ezekiel. We're going to Old Testament because in honor of Father's Day, I just want to condemn everyone <laughs> and really just encourage you guys. We are going to draw some contrast today and um, talk about a couple things. Um, and we'll put a little context to this to lighten it up, but it, it may be a little heavy sounding at first. So just know that God loves you as we read this. Um, how many of you guys know that we don't understand every single thing that we read or everything that God does? You don't understand it all. That's why it says don't lean on your understanding because most of the time the way that we're understanding comes from a preconceived lens or uh, filter that guards our perspective, that creates the perceptions that we carry every single day, and we understand and respond to things we experience, usually based on those lenses, right? And so therefore, everything that God does doesn't come through your lens. He may do stuff in different ways that you've ever seen, heard about, talked about, or experienced, but that doesn't mean that he's not doing something, amen? And so there's certain things we read all through the scripture that God does that it's hard to kind of figure out. You know, I mean, one of the biggest things you see in Christianity, and not just Christianity, but even the world's um, probably questions for Christianity is why God? Why this? Why that? Why does God do this? Why does God let this happen? Why did he not do this? Why did he do that? And the answer is, we don't know. We know some of them, Yeah. But most of them we probably don't know. When we think we know, he probably has already changed how he's doing it. So um, God is good. That's what we do know. So in reading this passage, I just want us to remember that God is really good and he's a good father. Amen? So I want to pull out a thought this morning. Ezekiel 22, verse number 30 and 31. This is the New Living Translation for Mike Roberts in hopes that he would get saved today. Um <laughs> I don't know if he's here today. or Oh, yeah, he is here. We're, that's weird. I didn't, I, I didn't know he went to church. I don't know. I didn't know he went to church. <laughs> Shoo on fire. We might take up another offering today. This is. Yeah, and he's awake. Blows my mind. All right, Ezekiel 22, verse number 30. It says, I looked for someone who might rebuild the wall of righteousness that guards the land. I search for someone to stand in the gap. Say stand in the gap. I search for someone to stand in the gap in the wall so I wouldn't have to destroy the land. Now, just hearing, not to spend any time on this, but the, the terminology here so that I wouldn't have to destroy the land. Now, how many of you guys know God can do whatever he wants to do? He has uh, a free will in and of himself to decide what he's going to do and what he's not going to do. But when you see God say, if this doesn't happen, I'm going to have to do something. It's not because it's necessarily what God wants to do. It's because there's been something set up and God honors his word. And therefore, if something goes a certain way, God always honors the thing that he committed to. So some of the things we see God do, especially in the Old uh, Testament, Old Covenant scriptures, are things that necessarily weren't weren't necessarily as hard, but there were things that he was in covenant to do. So keep that in mind. God is good. He says, ask for someone to stand in, the, or look for someone to stand in the gap in the wall so I wouldn't have to destroy the land, but I didn't find anyone. So now I will pour out my fury on them. Ouch. Consuming them with the fire of my anger. <laughs> wow. I will heap on their heads the full pen penalty for all their sins, I, the sovereign Lord, have spoken. <sighs> this encourages me because it's light and fluffy, right? <laughs> I mean, guys, when you just need a boost from the Lord, you go back and read Ezekiel 22, uh, this one, you know, pull it out. Oh, man, this is great, God. Just heap your fury and fiery wrath on my head because I'm an idiot, God. Just give it to me, you know? Like, this is... Um, these are those moments in the scripture we have to really think about context. And I'm thankful, and we'll get to why, but I'm thankful that the way God speaks to us today isn't necessarily like that. Now, some may disagree with that theology, but um, we'll just keep reading the Bible, and the Bible's theology will fix our disagreement, hopefully. Now, I'm going to keep reading because here's the context. If you back up a little bit, this is, again, a lighthearted, encouraging verse Ezekiel twenty-two seventeen through 22. 
Now listen to this. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to read it slow so we can really get it to sink in. This, then this message came to me from the Lord. Son of man, the people of Israel are worthless slag that remains after the silver is melted. What is slag? It's the invaluable part. It's the leftovers. All the value is gone. This is what's left over. So this is like a nice compliment, right? The people of Israel are worth the slag that remains after the silver is smelted. They are the dross that is left over, a useless mixture of copper, tin, iron, and lead. So tell them, this is what the sovereign Lord says, because you are all worthless slag. What if I just closed right there? (laughs) Because you guys are worthless slag. Amen. Would you come? Because you're all worth the slag, I will bring you to my crucible in Jerusalem. Just as silver, copper, iron, lead, and tin are melted down in a furnace, I will melt you down in the heat of my fury. (laughs) This is intense. I will gather you together and blow the fire of my anger upon you. And you will melt like silver in fierce heat. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have poured out my fury on you. Now, how many of you guys are looking forward to that part of the Bible, right? Where God comes, sends a prophet and says, you know what? Um, everything's a disaster. They're worthless. They're useless. Here's what I need you to tell them. Now, again, context goes a long way because these are people that God was in certain covenants with. God always does these beautiful things in covenant. And sometimes the things that he did weren't necessarily his heart. They were just repercussions to a covenant that had been made that had gone south. Amen. How many of you guys know that when you don't make your car payments for so many months, Um, the heat and the wrath of the bank show up in the form of a tow truck and they pour that wrath out on you by taking what you've paid for for a long time but stop paying for because it wasn't because they are just evil people it's because the covenant went south and that's simply what they have to do right if you don't make your house payments I mean think think about this for a second let's say you've been paying for your house for 20 years so you gotta let's no let's make it let's make it even just sweeter Let's say you got a 30 year mortgage and you've paid for 29 and a quarter years. A few more months, it's paid off. Freedom. Gonna go to Hawaii, got that, you know, house payment out of the way. But then three months, four months go by, you can't make the house payment. You're almost done with it. Can't pay it. Guess what the bank's gonna do? They're gonna take that bad boy. That hurts. Is it because the bank's evil? Some would, you, some would say yes. No, it's because we malfunctioned on a covenant that was made, an agreement that was made that went wrong. The repercussion is this is how it goes. So you've got an option. You do this, this is the result. You don't do this, this is the result. It's how God used a uh, relationship with a lot of people in the Scripture. But what I want to point out is, if you read more in that chapter, he talks about how they're murderers, they're idolaters, basically describes them in a very discouraging way that I think sometimes we um, forget about those parts of God. And some people, and I'll also fix this so we don't go crazy, but if you take this tone of the Lord and that becomes your gospel, you will kill the world before they could ever meet the Father. Yeah, Just because God's word says this doesn't mean you understand it. Just because he said it like that doesn't mean I understand where it's coming from. Context is everything, but knowing the one who said it is even more than that everything. If you don't know the one who has the voice, then you won't even understand what the voice is trying to articulate. I say, case in point, sometimes I'll say stuff up here. And anybody who's been here a length of time probably knows what I'm talking about because I've got quirky ways of communicating. And Kara tells me this all the time that I'm, I'm like, did that make any sense, honey? Because I I, like my brain got just turned off and, you know, lost a train of thought. And she's like, no, no, no. I know what you're trying to say. But sometimes she says that because she knows me. So she knows what I'm trying to say. Now, if you're a visitor here and you've never heard me speak and I've got some quirky communication issues, you may want to leave halfway through. Because I may leave some things hanging simply, not, not because I'm leaving it hanging on purpose, but because you just don't know me enough to know that I'm not going to leave it hanging. 
Does that make sense? So sometimes God said certain things and we took it and ran with it without ever understanding the heart of the one that was behind the voice. Amen? Remember that scripture says, the sheep know my voice? That's important, right? Why do you think Jesus came to reveal the nature of the Father? He came in the midst of that same type of generation where everything was broken. What should have been valuable now had become worthless. And I don't mean that in a mean way, but here's what the value issue was. When Adam was made in the image of God and righteousness was literally his posture, sin came in because of a decision and it divided It created a chasm between him and that right standing, that righteousness with God. And so what was valuable, what was intended to replenish the earth, to govern the earth, to have dominion and authority authority in the earth, now all of a sudden in that context of its intended value, now was completely worthless because it could no longer function in the thing that it was intended to function. It doesn't mean that Adam didn't have value. It means he didn't have the value that he was intended for. Yep. Hmm. Jesus comes and restores value, right? He bridges the gap. He stands in the gap. He does a work on our behalf, which is the gospel. It's beautiful. It's amazing. And then here we are, extremely valuable beyond words and beyond understanding. Mm. You guys are worth a lot of money. I don't know if you know that. But God's in this troubling moment of the Bible. It seems like he's fed up, he's angry, he's furious. And here's what I would also have to say. Don't try to understand God's portrayed emotions based on your experience with worldly emotions. In the same way that his love's better than my version of love, his anger may not be my version of anger. His fury may not look like my fury. Amen? His mercy may not look like my mercy. That's why I always need his version over my version. Amen? When I don't know how to love, I contend for the love of God. I go to the word and try to figure out how should I love God. Take my heart. When I need to extend grace or mercy to somebody, I need the grace and mercy of God to do that because it's not in me to do that the way that only God can do that. So we can't take and try to mold our idea of God based on our experiences in human form. Does that make sense this morning? You can't reduce what he's like to that because you'll immediately be boxed in to taking one of these passages and running wild with it. And if I took this passage... I could easily, context of the day, I could take this passage saying everything is worthless. You guys are all murderers, idolaters. I could scream that to the United States of America every single day on TV, call it ministry, and guess what I would be doing? The work of the enemy. Yeah? It's like, no, you got to tell them, man. You you, got to tell them. I'm pretty sure they already know. Amen? You don't have to tell broken people they're broken they're already hurting why would you kick them when they're down that wasn't what God was doing God was having a response to a covenant that went south and he probably I'll have to assume I don't know that God really wanted that covenant in the first place he offered them something they thought they could do they said yeah and that may not have been the right answer knowing full well when they said yes none of them could do it so I have to assume he probably had a little bit of future knowledge down the line that, man, they just signed up for something they cannot do, and this is going to be a little exhausting. They're going to misunderstand me, but praise God, they don't know there's a Jesus coming. Amen? And so there's a lot of things in mystery we don't quite know about yet, but what I want to think about is the culture of that day. So you've got murderers, you've got uh, harlots, you've got thieves, you've got just uh, think of the most just vile, crazy scene on the planet, and let's just say that's what this looks like. Now, how do you communicate to that kind of culture? Just think about it. Like, do you walk, like, if, if I walked into the most intense maximum security prison right now and said, I'm going to do some, some conversing, right? Not even ministry, just, I'm just going to talk to these guys, right? Do you think I would walk in there with a Care Bear t-shirt on a, f- a pound puppy for everybody. 
and some Dora the Explorer DVDs and try to relate to them based on that method. No, it wouldn't work, right? Think about how crazy culture is that like, even like think of small town versus inner city, different culture, totally different culture. The way that we talk in certain ways, I know there's similarities, but the way that we talk, some of our sayings, some of our uh, hangups or not hangups, like if you went into Seattle or New York City or somewhere and had the same conversations, people would not know what you're talking about. And it's not because it's wrong, it's because culture creates these things where understanding has to come through interpretation, yeah? Has to come through relationship. And the only way we're gonna really understand God is not through understanding his word, it's through understanding the relationship that he's given us, amen? I've gotta have a relationship with God or I'll never understand his word. Some of it's pretty, it's pretty easy, yeah? But he's the teacher, so if I read the word and I don't know the one who inspired it, I have a huge issue. It's called religion, right? Hmm. You guys are all worthless. You're what's left over after the valuable part is gone. Everything's broken. You're just messing everything up. I'm going to have to destroy you guys. And this is how he's communicating with the generation. See, I would argue probably that wasn't the Lord's heart. I don't think it was his heart to have to send that kind of message and to send that kind of judgment or to have to function in whatever his anger looked like. I don't think that was his heart. Did he do that? Sure. He said he had to because of something. But that, does that mean that's what he's like? No, 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 no. The greater revelation of what he's like in this context is that he's someone who keeps his word. It's not the revelation that he's an angry God trying to kill everybody who's not worth anything and he doesn't like people. Yep. Happy Father's Day. <laughs> but see, on Father's Day, if some of our earthly dads are really good dads, how much greater do you think he is at being a dad? You know, like I don't want to portray him as this kind of dad. I'm not saying the word of God's not pure and true. I'm just saying we don't always understand the word of God. So he's having this conversation. I don't think it was his heart. I think, honestly, it wasn't a reflection of the Lord's heart. It was more of a reflection of their heart. See, he had to communicate with them based on where they were, not where he is. How do I know that? Because in Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit comes now in a new covenant that's being made, set up, and launched. And the Spirit comes upon them, and they start to speak to the surrounding people in a way that was relevant, a way that they could understand each one in their own tongue and language. See, that's what he's like, and that's what he wanted to do. But because of covenants, the mercy and the grace of God was held prisoner by his own word. Until the time of Jesus came and set it free and let it loose. And I think God came out like a ravenous animal because that's what he always wanted to be like, which is what Jesus looked like. He didn't want to stone everyone who wasn't good enough. He wanted to release them from the thing that was causing them not to be good enough. He wanted to give them value when they had no value. He didn't want to just point out, hey, you guys are broken. Ha, ha, ha. Let me kick you in the head and pour some fiery hot molten lava on you. He didn't want to do that. That was never his heart. It was their culture. Now, let's also keep in our lens this morning that you can't take this verse and go prophesy this to the nations. Why? Because this verse has a Jesus coming down the line later. And if I take just this part without the Messiah that's coming then I have the right to be angry. But if I ever make it to Jesus and see what Jesus did and see the freedom that came, then all of a sudden my message has to now come through the understanding in the lens of Christ, not just what I think about the word of God. See, we've built empire churches based on our interpretation of the word and not really our relationship with God, which is a tragedy. See, the tone of the Lord, I think, was reflecting the culture of the day. So, turn to Romans. Chapter number six. I 
I say all that this morning just to put some context because I want to get back to the one where he said, I look for someone to stand in the gap to rebuild the walls of righteousness. Now, does God still work on those principles? Absolutely. Are there people who stand in the gap? Absolutely. Greatest one was Jesus. Amen. But how many guys know that we're here on planet earth empowered by the salvation of Christ, not that so we can complain and whine, but so that we can stand in the gap and be a bridge from the heavens into the earth that what God wants to do in the earth as he's doing in heaven can be released on people, that we can love people, we cannot judge people, we can set them free. And those who are hurting, we don't have to talk about how much they're hurting. We just get to be a different option than what the pain that they've always known. We don't get to walk into the broken place and say, hey, everybody's broken. Wow, everybody's broken broken. Wow, everybody. No, we get to walk in and say, you know what? I know you're broken, but there's something better. And if I could just distract you long enough with the love of God, it would start to take your mindset off of the thing that's got you so broken and in prison. And if we can magnify the gospel to a generation, maybe we wouldn't have to teach that generation about stop sinning all the time because they would be so captivated by the love of God that they might forget what sin is like. See, the method of the gospel isn't fix yourself and get me. The method of gospel is get me and I'm going to fix yourself. You cannot fix what only God can fix in the same way I can't love the way that only God can love. This is what Jesus was doing. This was the mystery that he carried, right? He's walking in the midst of this culture and everything they knew was based on God's going to come and punish and judge and smite you. And if you mess up, that's it. You're toast. And even the Pharisees that thought they had qualified, Jesus starts to disqualify through conversations one by one. Yeah? They bring the woman in adultery, and Jesus says, you know what? Who's the spotless guy with the rock? Let him go ahead. Everybody leaves, right? They start talking about adultery, you know, great church topic. Well, you messed up. That's like one of the ones. Isn't it funny how in the church we make like these big sins, then we forget about all the small ones conveniently. That's called bull crap. It's in the Bible. <laughs> it's called lack of intelligence, honestly. But we say, oh, they committed adultery. They had a, a hiccup. And man, ah, and Jesus says, you know what? If you even looked at someone, it's a heart issue. And he starts to think, starts to minimize what they always thought was an action. He makes it so big that they have to start to think differently than they thought about it before. What was he doing? He wasn't just trying to condemn them. He was trying to expand their lens of thinking. Because the way they always interpreted the action was do bad, judgment. Now Jesus is making it bigger, say, wait a minute. What is bad? And what is judgment? What is adultery? Where does it start? Where does it, I mean, think about what's running through their mind that all of a sudden they thought, man, we got this to all of a sudden maybe I don't have this. Man, and it wasn't because Jesus wanted to point out their flaws. It's because he wanted to set them up knowing that if they didn't understand they couldn't do it, then they couldn't really receive what he was about to do. Hmm. So we've got a city. We've got a state. We've got a nation. We've got a world that we live in. How do we stand in the gap for this world and rebuild the wall of righteousness? Let me say it like this. How do we rebuild the wall of rightness where God intended mankind to have relationship with him, to be the provider, to be that father? How do we rebuild that wall in this world? Because that's our commission. That's what we're here for. Yeah. Now, one of those is very simple It's prayer. Everybody get that one? Standing in the gap is intercession. All throughout the scripture, they're interceding on behalf of a people who probably didn't deserve it. Someone was always showing up last minute, and if they didn't, God would still give somebody a chance to step up who was righteous, you know? Show me one in the city, and I won't destroy them, you know? And people were constantly stepping in the gap, saying, you know what, God, uh, let me just be the mediator. I know, like, they're crazy, but, like, they... They're really good. They got good hearts, you know? And God, time and time again, even in that covenant, was always stretching. Honestly, he was stretching his mercy in that covenant time and time again. Sometimes he stretched it so far, he might have almost looked like he was going to break his word, but he didn't. 
but he just kept stretching it and stretching it. Give them, la- I mean, it was like if he gave you 10 seconds, like that 10 seconds, he would drag out because the day with the Lord is as a thousand years, thousand years as a day. So when he, God gives you 10 seconds, his 10 seconds may not be your 10 seconds, right? So thank God for his timing, not ours. But sometimes he say, you know, you got 10 seconds to fix this, guys. And that 10 seconds, thanks be to God, may end up being 10 years because his timing's a little different. And sometimes what he's doing, even though we don't understand it the same way, it still doesn't mean that he's uh, not honoring his word. He's honoring his word in everything, even if he's stretching it. But people would stand in the gap. They would contend. Sometimes it would work out. Sometimes it wouldn't. So how do we stand in a gap? For a generation, how do we stand in the gap while we're alive on planet Earth and be the difference? Prayer is one of those things. Prayer is powerful. Here's what I do want to challenge, though. If you are someone who just stands in the gap in prayer and nothing else, then you're not standing in the gap. You're just standing. Amen? Because to be in the gap And to bridge from one side to the other means that whatever's going on in the gap has to be different. It can't be like this world. It's got to be something that links this world to the world that God is trying to release. That's what Jesus did, right? The word made flesh, dwelt among us. Everybody say dwelt. That's King James Version. He dwelt among us. Now, think about this, because Jesus, Jesus was the ultimate stand in the gapper. Jesus shows up, and he simply is Jesus, right? He is the Son of God, by definition, right? By identity's definition. He is the Son of God. He's the Messiah. He's all of these things. He shows up, the Word made flesh. In other words, what was just spoken now all of a sudden is visible. And it's not visible just so it can say it some more. It's visible so that it can be what was said. See, remember before Abraham, I am? That was a slap in the face of their culture. That was a challenge. And Jesus simply was that I am. And he comes and he stands in the gap, leaves the heavens, comes into this world, and in between the heavens and this world, there's a Jesus. And Jesus shows up. He's the word made flesh. He's ministering hope and all of these things. He's also disqualifying all the ones who thought they were qualified, and he's starting just to mess with everybody's stuff, right? I mean, he's just messing with everybody's interpretations, ideas, and they're condemning him because he's hanging out with the people he shouldn't hang out with. He's releasing forgiveness of sins and mercy and talking to prostitutes and touching those who are unclean to touch. And this is just Jesus being Jesus, right? I don't think he just set out to do it to shock them. He was just doing it because that's who he was. And in that, all of a sudden, the lame start to walk, the blind begin to see, the oppressed get set free, those who are possessed by demons all of a sudden get liberated, dead people come back to life, And the funny thing is, Jesus didn't come necessarily to do that. He came to die for our sins, to reconnect and rebuild the wall of righteousness between God and man. He came to stand in the gap. And while standing in the gap, he simply was himself, and himself was what allowed heaven to come into the earth on a level that we have never seen before, nor do we understand still. So when I say that when we pray for the world, that's great. It's, again, not to minimize prayer. Prayer is powerful. You should always be praying. Amen? But make sure you're praying, not complaining. You know? Uh, let me say it like this. If your prayer to God is Ezekiel chapter number 22, God, they're all idolaters. They're worthless. They're this, that, then you need to shut up. Go fix your theology, come back to the Lord and hear his will rather than just tell him the CNN news of what's going on bad in the world. I'm pretty sure he's aware, amen? Prayer's not about you just talking to God. It's more about God talking to you. Jesus comes, he's bridging that gap. How do you bridge the gap? You don't bridge the gap just by prayer. You bridge the gap by becoming. Guess what? Jesus died for you. 
You know what the big issue in their day was and everything that he's talking about? They're murderers, they're idolaters, they're fornicators, they're all of these things. You know why he could say that about them? Because there was a sin issue. You know why the sin issue was there? Because of the covenant of the law that they had to compare it to. You know what Jesus came to do? Fulfill that law and move that standard out of the way and become the new standard through relationship to say, you know what? You're not going to get everything right. Try to. You're not going to get everything right, though, but that's why I'm here. Because now no one can call you this anymore. Even if you're in the midst of challenge or no matter what your history is, nobody can call you that anymore if you know how to identify with what Jesus did, not the law that he fulfilled. They say, is God's law gone? Is it? No, no, no. It's just in a person who can change your heart, not in you who can try to change your actions and fail. See, I can't keep in my flesh without the Holy Spirit. I cannot keep myself from sinning and keeping every part of the law. Somewhere I'm going to break something. Even if you get the big 10 right, you know, Somewhere. That's why Jesus says, you know what? You didn't do it, but you thought about it in your heart, and therefore it's done. You know what he did? He just put me in a baby cradle because I need him. Sometimes it's not that he wants to condemn us or expose us, but sometimes that's the only way he can get us in his lap. It's the only way he can be Abba, and we'll allow him to be Abba, is when we're so disqualified and vulnerable that we have no one else to turn to. That's what fathers do. But you know that like the fathers in the new covenant, he's not here to punish you with the fury of molten lava, wrath, and fire brimstone. He disciplines, but discipline's not necessarily the same thing as punishment. It's a hard issue. You know, again, I've talked about this before, but my dad gave me a lot of spankings. Praise God. I could use a few more. And they were the spankings that, like, you leave, and you're wondering, did the neighbors hear that? You know, like, and when I say neighbors, we lived up a hollow in the mountains, and our closest neighbors were, I mean, you could not see their house from our house, I'll tell you that. And we're still worried if they're hurted or not, because everything echoes down, you know. And I'm manly, but I was screaming, you know. And dad would just spank me, spank me. Most of the time I deserved it. Is it because he hated me? No. Everybody knows this. It's because he knows there's something better for me than I know. And that I have to learn which way to go. We're trying to train our dog on a shock collar right now. Now, animal activists don't even start, right? <laughs> it's like you can barely feel it. It's not going to kill the guy. It's for his own protection because we don't want him to get hit by a car. Would you rather him get shocked or would you rather him die? So there you go. And I told Kara before God, I said, this dude, I mean, this dude, this dog, he's a dude. He, he acts like he's just the alpha male. So I tell him about every night, if I wrestle him especially, like my stage wrestling name is Alpha Male, and I make sure he knows it. So I'll get him down in a headlock, and I'm like, I'm the alpha male. I'm the alpha male. And we've got this cool relationship. And he, he likes to act tough. He likes to, you know, bark and be crazy. And I said, two, two options here. Either he's, he's going to be so hyper, he's going to take the shock and go through it. Or the other side, because he's just a big baby, he's going to sit there and not want to move. So we put the shock collar on him. You know, he does not know what's going on. Now, this... Here's the hard part. Again, I, I, I can't imagine when I have kids having to spank one. I'm not looking forward to having that encounter. I'm sure some of you guys have had that and probably enjoy it by now. I know Mike does, but I'm not. I'm not probably. <laughs> Sorry, Mike. I just, when, when you're on fire, um, I'm like looking at him. I'm thinking, man, he's just out here like smiling, tongue hanging out. He has no idea what's about to happen. Like he's going to get up to where he's always been able to go and all of a sudden he can't go there anymore. It's going to beep and warn him. And if that prophetic beep doesn't warn him, also be it, there's going to be a lightning bolt from heaven, a.k.a. the collar that's going to let him know real quick who the sovereign Lord is and it is pet safe. <laughs> and he gets up to there and he gets shocked and poor little guy. 
And now, like, I love it because Kara's the always one who tries to train him. I was like, if we're doing this, you're the one training him. You, you're the one who wants to do this. I'm not going to be the punisher. That's you. So now she's like the evil queen of Sheba. Every time she wants to take Finley out, he runs and hides. And I'm like, this is great. I'm like, Finley, let's go outside. He's like, yeah, coming out of the bed and all excited. She's like, come on, Finley, let's go. Let's go potty. He takes off, hides under the bed, will not come out. Literally, she has to drag him out. And I'm thinking, see, I, it's about time you saw her true side, right? <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. <laughs> he gets shocked, though, and now all he does is he kind of hugs the house. He's still learning. We're, get, we're getting him more comfortable. Every once in a while, he'll run around a little bit, but it's totally kept him in bounds. Little bit of pain. Wasn't malicious. We didn't, we didn't like, want to hurt the dog just for fun. Hey, babe, what do you want to do now? I don't know. Let's hurt the dog. Let's go get a shot collar and kill the dog. That'd be great, right? We didn't, that wasn't our goal. Our goal was for him to understand something. And it's something that if he can learn to use it, will give him freedom without getting hit by a car, right? See, God disciplines us in ways that are way more graceful than we realize, Sometimes we even miss it, and sometimes we're calling things in our life the chastisement of the Lord that is not the discipline of the Lord at all. Sometimes it's the work of the enemy. We're confessing it and receiving it and thinking that it's God. You ever heard this when somebody gets sick and they think, well, this is just God's will? Let me tell you another Bible verse. That's bull. I think it's First uh, Macaroni 12, 2. It says, that's a load right there. Why? Because you say, you say, well, man, no, 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 God could stop this. See, here we go. We're going back to that. Well, why God? You know why we have so many whys? And they'll always be wise, but you know why we leave them out there? Because we don't really know him to the level we can. Because there's something about him that I now know that when I read this kind of part of him, I can understand from it. I can learn from it. I don't feel like that's what he's like, Right? I don't feel like when I get sick that God put that on me because I know him and I know he's not like that. I know that's not his heart, especially after the cross of Jesus paid it all for me not to even be sick. But the second we receive that, the second we take ownership of it, you know how you stand in the gap of a city and see cultures change is by becoming the thing that God says about you, not just talking and praying about it. Talking, preaching, teaching, prayer is all powerful, but without transformation, pointless. Jesus paid it all. That's pointless if you're not going to receive what he paid for. I said Romans, and I'll, I'll close here. Most of you guys know this verse. Romans 6, 1 through 4. It says, well then, should we keep on sinning so that God can show us more and more of his wonderful grace? Of course not. Since we have died to sin, how can we continue to live in it? Or have you forgotten that when we were joined with Christ in baptism, we joined him in his death? For we died and were buried with Christ by baptism. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we also may live new lives. Emphasize that last one. Now, because of all this taking place, what he just did in Romans, one of my favorite uh, books of the Bible, because it starts out almost with the tone of an old covenant. It's a lot of action based. He's pointing out some things. And then it progresses to so, say, you know what? All of the, basically, all of this stuff is broken, but now, therefore, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. In other words, all this stuff is true, but let me give you a greater truth that if you could let it become your reality, it will liberate you from all the junk that you can't perform, you can't do right, you can't get it right, all the depression, brokenness, all that stuff, just get Jesus and you won't have to try to micromanage your flesh anymore. And Romans becomes this glorious journey and they're kind of shocked trying to figure it out saying, wait a minute, I thought we were supposed to not do all of these things. And he's like, you know what? You don't do all those things, but you don't do them because greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. And you're the one in the world. Sometimes the one in the world is not the enemy. Sometimes it's our flesh that's in the world. And God wants to bridge the gap between the heavens and the world. And you know how he does it? between the one that's in the world, my flesh side, 
And the one that's in the heavens is by becoming in this, letting him that's in me become greater than my part that's in the world, all of a sudden the word becomes flesh and we simply dwell in who we are rather than just talk about it. You know how you bridge a gap in a city so that they can receive the love of a father by modeling the thing that we always talk about. Amen? You can't teach what can only be modeled. See, the Father can love you and love you and love you greater than he can tell you about his love for you. And he's told us it amazingly about his love for us. But how much more powerful it is when you experience that love. So how do you become that? How do we become that wall of rightness in the city, in the region, in the nation, that wall of right standing with God? By being perfect? No, by Jesus being perfect. Pull up that last Romans verse one more time. Everybody look at this last line. He's basically saying, everybody messed up, now there's salvation. This is what happened. You were crucified with Christ, you know? Everything that you were, forget about it. Let's move on. There's a new thing. We've got to learn how to operate it, how to flow with it, how to let him be all things and everything. And it says, now we also may live new lives. I love the word may in there because just because it says that doesn't mean that we do it, right? Let me say it like this. To become the thing that God wants us to be in the earth, you have to actually take ownership of the word that he's spoken over your life. Yep. So like when he says you're saved, I've wiped your sins away, there's now a new life, then don't let when you mess up, all of a sudden become everything. Amen? I like that. What's going on there? Some TV. She's watching the U.S. Open. I knew it! I got a verse for you. It's in Ezekiel 22. Thank you, best. I'm close. I promise here. If we don't take ownership of what the gospel says, what it is, then what's the point? Jesus died for you. He died as you. You were crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, you live, but it's not you living. It's Christ in you, Galatians 2.20, right? He's having a revelation saying, you know what? Everything I was is gone. I'm still here, but it's not really me anymore. There's something going on in my house that doesn't seem right. In other words, the part of me that's in the world is being infected by something that's coming out of heaven, and it's creating a bridge. It's creating uh, standing in the gap, so to speak. So even the world around me is going to start to change because I become something, not because I just talk about something. So if you want to see the city change, you don't just, you, I, I can't tell you, just go love them more. No, 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 because you can't love them more if you can't get more of his love for you first. If you want to see the city change through the love of God, then let God love you the way he says he loves you. Let go of all the stuff you think's blocking his love. Let, law, let go of all your ideas about yourself that make you feel like worthless slag and leave you broken and invaluable in certain areas of your life. You need to know that you are the righteousness of Christ paid for by a price that no one can pay except for the Son of God, and it is done. See, Jesus paid for you to be able to stand up and say, you know what, I'm spotless without blemish. That shocks people. So they think, well, no, I've done bad things. It doesn't matter. He's done something greater than all my bad things. And even though I'm not perfect in my flesh yet, my spirit is with Christ in heavenly places. You say, well, no, I don't know. But it's just, that's Bible. That part's easy to understand. He says it. Doesn't mean I get it, but I understand what he's saying is pretty plain simple. You're seated, hidden with Christ in God. So how can you be there and here? It's just each end of the bridge. It's the in-between. That as we become the word made flesh, what God said about you, the word starting to live in our thoughts and our actions. When I feel invaluable, I just say, you know what? I am the righteousness of Christ. I was worth him dying for, and that must be worth something. So I'm just going to start saying that over my life every day instead of feeling like 
junk. Because when you can receive it for yourself, all of a sudden you'll look at everyone else differently. Usually when we're upset with people or hate people, it's because we hate something about them that we have in ourselves. And when we see it, it triggers the alarm and we go off and we're angry and the rage monster comes out, right? And that's what judgment does. And then we excuse it with the word because we go back to Ezekiel and we're like, no, I'm good. I'm saved. They're not. Let's kill them. In love. <laughs> Metaphorically. See, I want to be a generation who stands in the gap of what was lost and see a world won to Jesus in a way that we maybe have never tried before. Amen? See, it's imperative, guys, that we have these kind of conversations in our churches on Sundays, Mondays, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, whenever we have church. Why? Because if we don't learn how to posture ourselves in regions, regions will fail to be impacted just like they have been and have been and have been. I'm not saying that I mean, regions have been impacted so many times, but there's still a greater reality of the kingdom to be released, and no one has seen that yet. And chances are it won't come in any way that we've tried. So my words won't do what my transformation can display. Because you know what the reflection of the Father was? Because this is beautiful too, and you can, you can stand so you know I'm done. Bring, bring the babies. <laughs> I wanted to be long-winded on Father's Day because patience is a godly feature. I'll, I'll just read this first to you about Ezekiel. He's condemning them all. You're the dross. You're the slag left over of what's valuable is gone. You're just the remains. You're basically all of these elements. You're, I'm just going to melt you. I'm going to draw you to my crucible. I'm going to put you in the pot, and I'm just going to melt everything. And you understand that sometimes the purging and the fire of God isn't meant to kill you. It's meant to purge you. It's actually meant to cleanse you. Yeah? Because later on, and again, this has a couple different things to teach from, but just to draw this one uh, picture out. Second Peter 3 says, But the day of the Lord will come unexpectedly as a thief. Then the heavens will pass away with terrible noise, and the very elements, the elements themselves will disappear in fire, and the earth and everything on it will be found to deserve judgment, since everything around us is going to be destroyed like this. What holy and godly lives you should live looking forward to the day of God and hurrying it along. On that day, he will set the heavens on fire and the elements will melt away in flames. But we are looking forward to the new heavens and the new earth. He has promised a world filled with God's righteousness. See, you understand that Jesus was our crucible. See, Jesus is the place where God took all of our broken silver, gold, tin, copper, everything. He poured it into the bowl that is the Son of God made flesh. And as his wrath was satisfied in that moment, poured out, everything that we couldn't fix was melted away. Everything. And the only reason it's not necessarily functioning in our life is because we may not have taken ownership of it. See, it says that we may live new lives doesn't mean that you're going to, because what that word to me implies is that you have permission to if you want to. See, the Father's given you permission and access to every single thing that he has for us. Amen? And some of those things that he has for us are absolutely exactly what the world's waiting on to show up on a people. Yeah? Let's pray. Let's, let's just open our palms to the Lord. Just close your eyes, man. I just want to pray over us. Because I want us to know, if anything today, how valuable we are. You say, no, I'm a filthy rag. No, 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 he died. He died for you. He died because he loved you. He died because before it was ever broken, it was never about sin. It was about him being one with mankind before sin ever came into the picture. That was the heart of God. God never messed up. Humanity's perspective created a gap that they could no longer walk in peace and unity and harmony and joy and righteousness. See, righteousness isn't 
uh, defined, I don't think, in a uh, biblical understanding. It's not defined because you kept all the rules. Righteousness was there before the rules. It was the intent of the Father that his likeness should dwell in the earth as it is in heaven. That likeness came back 2,000 years ago as Jesus. And he said, you know what? There's this covenant over you guys. I'm just going to go ahead and fulfill that for you, and then I'm going to die. And I'm just going to make everything right again. And if you want to, you can have it. Because I'm not a dictator. I, I just want to give you the option. I love you. You can have it. Hmm. He's not a father who forces. He's a father who likes to teach and likes to watch his children learn. He's a father who wants the best for humanity to know that there's a world that's greater than suffering and pain and wars and rumors of wars and murderers and thievery and all of that stuff. It's not that he hates thieves. He hates thievery. Why? Because there's something better than that that would liberate the heart of mankind rather than keep it in prison.